Hello, and welcome to Horror Rewind. This is Kelly Florence. And I'm Meg Hofdahl. And this week we're talking about... Da-da-da-dun. Da-da-da-dun. Da-da-da-da. da 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 The Adams Family. <laughs> it's the Adams Family. How are you, Meg? Good. I'm so good. We're, we're here at the Vampire Con still, and it's really fun and um, good people watching. It's great. So... We haven't seen each other in a long time, like since the beginning of April, I think. And then all of a sudden it's it's May and things are just happening so fast. Hence, like the end of the school year, I had my last classroom day the other day and I'm just grading papers and you only have a few weeks left without kids at home. <laughs> yes. I, I sort of gauge everything by that. <laughs> yeah. I'm really excited for summer. I'm going on lots of fun trips and we're doing fun stuff and um, I like camping in my RV. Not I don't do tent, tent camping um, but glamping perhaps. And so I like all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to like get some work done um, before the kids are out of school. <laughs> yeah. it's It changes the day like the whole schedule of the day when the kids are in school versus okay now this is it's on so you picked the adams family and i i in 20 years or like when did it come out it came out the same year as people under the stairs in 1891 and i have not seen it since i was a kid either so it was really almost sort of weird because it was like bringing back these like sort of visceral memories Do you want to tell us a little history about the movie? Sure. Okay. So, like I said, it came out in 1991, and it has kind of an interesting history. Um, It was based on cartoons, one-panel cartoons that Charles Adams um, came up with, um, and they were published in The New Yorker between 1938 and 1988 when he passed away. Um, and they dealt with the characters that are in the movie, Gomez, Morticia, Wednesday, Pugsley, um, Uncle Fester, all of them. And, um, then in the sixties, uh, the TV show was on for several seasons and that really sort of ramped up the popularity. And actually, um, the people, the New Yorker were very snooty. And as soon as there was a TV show, they did not allow Adam's family cartoons in the New Yorker because they felt like, um, if it was on TV, that it was less than. So at, during that time, there were no Adams um, cartoons. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so the TV show happened, and at that time, they became this huge phenomenon. In fact, um, there's some great quotes. It says, um, the family has a profound influence on American comics, cinema, and television. Um, according to the Telegraph, the Adamses are one of the most iconic families in American history up there with the Kennedys. So I thought that was really interesting. And it really, when I was doing my research about it, they were talking about how they are a huge influence on goth culture and like what sort of goth so to speak, people wear and how they conduct themselves. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and that leads us to um, 1991 when the Adams Family movie came out. And then um, a few years later, Adams Family Values, which um, I remember loving as well as a kid. And did you know that there is a third movie that came out in 1998 and Gomez is played by Tim Curry? If you could see Kelly's face right now, I had no idea. It says it said direct to video, but how I've never even seen. Have you ever seen like an image of it? No. What? They said Tim Curry plays Gomez. That's perfect. Yeah. So, okay. Um, and there was plans in about 2013 to make a sort of stop motion animation style in the sort of style of, um, nightmare on Elm street. Um, or not night. <laughs> Nightmare Before Christmas? Sorry. I sounded so smart until I said that. Um, Yeah, Nightmare Before Christmas, and Tim Burton was going to do it. But that never happened. Um, But now they're saying that there is going to be a film. As of 2017, um, it's still being kicked around, so we'll see. Um, Oh, and they, of course, have sort of infested all of um, sort of all media and I remember as a kid um, spending my summer playing the Super Nintendo Adams Family game did you ever play any of those? No. What was it? So it was 16 bit and I would go and rent it 
I mean, I, that was back when you just rented video games, and I would go to Blockbuster week after week and just rent it, and it was like, you know, it was basically a basic platform type game that took place in their house, but I had to have it because it was Adam's family. So, um, and you can probably imagine when I was a kid that I automatically and instantly was obsessed with this movie. How about you? All right, so my Adam's family story, like Adam's family was just sort of one of those things that permeated pop culture like and I was aware of them and I was aware of the song but I had never seen it because things didn't I we had an antenna and we had four channels so I like there was no cable where it was airing on if it was like I never saw it so I never saw the old tv show my first actual exposure to it was this 1991 movie and it was like holy crap this is this is me I couldn't believe they're so unapologetic about being dark and loving dark things and their dark sense of humor. And it's fine because they they joke about murdering and everything, but they're actually a super functional family and it's one of the strongest marriages in cinematic history. It's like marriage goals, hashtag marriage goals. Like I love watching their marriage. I love everything about their house I love everything about their family dynamic so I was watching this rewatch with my seven-year-old he didn't watch all of it but he watched most of it and it was so funny because I was sort of comparing myself because I was that I was seven when this movie came out and I don't know exactly how old I was when I saw it probably a couple years later and it was funny to see the difference between how I was as a child and him because he had so many questions. He had like a thousand questions because it didn't necessarily speak to him on like a sort of an, on a, yeah, a heartfelt level. And so he's like, wait, why, why is Wednesday trying to electrocute her brother? Like, wait, why, why? And I remember watching it and it made so much sense to me. Everything made perfect sense to me. So I have told you the story. I think when we first met, not soon after we first met, like we realized how alike you and I are. And I remember like we both like dark things. And I said, I used to pretend like I would carry around a plastic knife and like pretend to murder my sister with like a ski mask on. And I'm like, the headline in the newspaper will be like, she murdered her sister on a Friday or whatever. And obviously I wasn't going to murder my sister, but I like that was a funny way to play. And so... Like having, and then nobody ever said like, you can't play like that. That's wrong. It's just, it's just who I was. It was fine. And we're, it's fine. My sister's alive, by the way. (laughs) And it was just like, this spoke to me. So I watched it. And then when my kids got home from school, I watched it again with them. Cause I'm like, they have to see this. And we just kept saying like, Wednesday is Vienna. Cause she's so dark. And she thought the electrocution scene was hilarious. So she gets it. (laughs) And Campbell thought it was hilarious too. Yeah, yeah, no, it, yeah, it was fun. It was, it was interesting to see the, the, the differences of like me as a kid being like, of course. Okay, so I have to just jump to the scene because it's one of my favorite scenes of all time. And it, I think it honestly wrote on the slate of who I am and is a huge influence on me. Okay, so the scene is when they're on stage and they're doing the Shakespeare. Um, performance and they incorporate the blood that when I saw that as a kid I was like I was just it was like that's me that's me I see me it was like that feeling of when I had seen Lydia and Beetlejuice and I was like that's that's who I am like and the the contrast of the performance before that and then that performance, you know, the performance of the kids, like, doing their little song and all that. And then her doing this dramatic Shakespeare monologue and then the blood. And also the the parents' reactions to it. I mean, most of the parents were mortified by Wednesday and Pugsley's performance. But their parents were so proud and they gave them a standing ovation. And it was, like, that supportive family. And, oh, the teacher's talking to Morticia, like, oh, you know, this is who Wednesday um is her hero and she's like I've told her college first like you can't be burned in the streets as a witch yet it's too soon like it's so funny but it's so earnest and genuine and functional they are a perfectly functional family and there's so much love and like this 
marriage is absolutely hashtag goal, relationship goals because Gomez treats her like a goddess and she treats him like the best. They ha- they're so amazing. Like, I just want to watch them. Oh, and the way they light Angelica Houston, like her eyes throughout the movie. Oh, so going back, when I was doing my um, research on Vampira many moons ago, I saw that Morticia came first, Vampira came second, and Elvira came third. And so you're talking about the history of the Adams family. Like I had no idea it went back that far until I did that research. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like I, like I knew about the Adams family TV show, but I hadn't realized it was from these cartoons so long ago. And so Morticia is really like our mother, our Gothic mother. She started it all and cast perfectly by the way, Angelica Houston. And yes, the lighting on her the whole time. I'm just like, Oh my gosh. So here's an interesting contrast. The house in People Under the Stairs and this house. This house is similar in a lot of ways. There's secret passageways and like slides. And um, I remember just being absolutely in love with this house and like the whole like secret basement sort of thing. So it's sort of interesting how they have these sort of trappings, the same sort of things that um, they did in People Under the Stairs. And on the outside, the Adams family would seem like they would be more threatening. But of course, they aren't. Exactly. It's actually very harmless. And even when, like, the house traps um, the, the mother and brings her in, it's just, it's funny. It's all funny games. <laughs> it's hilarious. This movie is genuinely funny. It's so wonderful. And, uh, yeah, it speaks to my soul. I realize that's dramatic. But I freaking love Wednesday so much. I love Morticia, too. But, I mean, I love everybody. But, like... Wow. I think we'll have to watch the sequel soon because I feel like um, Wednesdays in it gets a little bit more screen time in the sequel. I remember watching that more, I think, as a kid for that reason because obviously Wednesday um, <laughs> was very much an idol of mine. Um, my kids loved um, Thing and uh, Cousin It. They were fans. <laughs> Um, so that was fun and it was, it was fun to sort of expose them to this. Um, even if, even if it doesn't really speak to them on any sort of, um, sort of level that it did to me, but, um, yeah, it it was, it was really fun to watch. And there were just like little visual moments that I had recalled from watching it when I was, you know, 10 and it was, it was just really neat to watch it again. And I think the part I, I, like I said, that I loved the most was, was the blood scene because I remember it just being like opening my eyes and just being like, Oh my God. I love this so much. I love this. Um, Dexter, my seven-year-old, had a lot of questions about that. (laughs) So Vienna and Campbell watched this movie with me, and then we did um, watch Adam's Family Values already, but let's rewatch it for the podcast, of course. Um, Yeah, Wednesday is in it more. And so after that blood scene, like Campbell and Vienna loved it. And Vienna is like our soul sister because she loves dark things. After that, she got a red permanent marker and she drew blood on a bunch of her stuffed animals because she thought it was hilarious. And that's fine. You know, we're, we're not keeping anything sacred in our house. Like, she's cut some hair. She's cut some eyeballs out. Like, whatever. It's like Wednesday with her head popped off in, from the guillotine doll. Like, I love that. Yeah, it, it's... it again it's like it was it's neat to see yourself on screen and again to see that it's a functional family and that everything's okay and she's not really killing anybody she just loves all these things and she's actually a good person and when she sees that uncle fester so to speak and the other person are bad you know she wants to she wants to you know tell people and so she's not a nefarious person so do you want to know something really cool i haven't told you this yet do you know I can't remember his name now in the movie, but the cousin who Wednesday's dancing with at the ball, the goodbye party for Fester. And he's also in Adam Val- Adam's Family Values. It's my friend Ryan Hollihan, who was Lisa, my, our friend Lisa's roommate in college. And I interviewed him about his time on the movie. Take a listen. So uh, joining us today we have Ryan Hollihan he's from he's calling in or I'm called him from Florida he's from Florida what am I saying (laughs) he's in Florida right now you see how well this is going Ryan (laughs) I'm actually from Southern California 
California, working in Florida currently. <laughs> yes, so he is currently in Florida. And But you grew up in California, is that correct? Yes, Southern California. So tell us how you got into acting, first of all. Um, well, I see, you know, my sixth grade play is when I decided I actually thought I might enjoy it. And then... Um, what was your sixth I, grade play? Uh, my sixth grade play was your good man, Charlie Brown. And I got the role of Charlie Brown. Oh, which was, yeah. Which was really like a surprise to me and really strange. I remember thinking, cause I was very shy when I was young. I still consider myself shy, but when I was young, I was really shy, I think. And, um, so yeah, I did that. And then when I was in high school, they opened a school of the arts right when I was going into ninth grade, very close to me, the first like school of the arts in Orange County, California, um, which is in between LA and, and San Diego. Oh, okay. But, um, but it was like the first, first arts high school. And actually I didn't go there for my first two years because I was already friends with people in the high school that I was supposed to go to. But then, after two years, they canceled that arts program at, at my high school, or at least the theater department. And I was like, oh, well, I, I don't like this. So I, I knew the ingoing choral teacher at the arts high school, and I called them, and it, it was actually already t- too late to go into it for that summer, for my junior year. But then when I called, and um, I said... Uh, I like to audition. They were like, oh, uh, well, auditions are closed. And then when they found out I was a boy, because my voice even back then was high as a guy, oh, they were okay. like, oh, no, we need guys. So come on in. <laughs> oh, that's we'll awesome. See you. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, um, so I, I went to my junior and senior year at the Orange County High School of the Arts, or as it's now called, the Orange County School of the Arts. And, um, graduated with some people that have done some things and um when I was in a senior and I was doing a chorus line uh with with my friends um one of them being Stephanie J. Block who was the original Alpha and is now in all falsettos and things like that and anyway, wow. when I was doing that uh an agent came to see the show not because I invited them but just because a friend a friend's sister's agent came to see her and I was like oh do you think I could meet him after the show and she's like sure so I met him and I went up to, then I, he invited me up to LA and he's like you were great let's start sending your picture out so I did and the first audition I got was true story the Adams family it was the very first professional audition that I ever went to oh my gosh yeah yeah it was, it was weird and surreal and um what did, they, audition, what did they have and, you do for your first audition? Uh, <laughs> well, they had me, like, do a little waltz, even though the casting director had no idea what a waltz was. Okay. Um, he just asked me, do you know how to waltz? Because he knew I did musical theater. And I was like, yeah, I, I think I do. You know, it's just one, two, three, like this. And he's like, okay, so do that. Now turn to the camera and say this line. And I... I did it, but I got it wrong because I was so nervous. Oh, yeah. And he laughed. And I think it was like the the line was, Aunt Morticia, your niece is sure a lovely dancer. And I was just so nervous that I turned to the camera and I think I said something like, why, Aunt Morticia, your niece is sure a lovely daughter. (laughs) (laughs) And um, so then... Yeah, I got a couple more. They kept calling me back, even though it wasn't really a speaking role. It was like a featured role, but it, it, I didn't have any lines. So I was like, why are they, what is this all about? And then my agent like kind of explained it to me that at the time, the Adams Family was the most expensive film ever made. Wow. At that time. Yeah, it was like, I mean, now it, it's nothing. But back then... I think it was a $40 million budget. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and and so I, then I finally got it and um, went to all these fittings and because I was part of the family, it was like 
more involved um, because the family looks special. You know? Right. And because I was a hunchback, it was a very um, custom-made costume. So, so I did that, and it was just a magical type of experience. That's amazing. Me. It's like this is like the the fairy tale dream come true because it's your first audition and you get to be cast in the Adams family. Right. Oh, yeah, it was. It was a fairy tale from beginning to end, and I remember. My last day on the set, I was trying to cover it, but I was kind of crying as I was leaving the, the, the lot because I was like, oh, my God, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, and it was just a magical kind of experience just to be there. So, yeah. That's amazing. That's- yeah, that's how I got into acting, and I know you're making your drink based on the Adams Family, right? Yeah, Lisa is making a drink this week uh, based on the Adams Family movie, so we'll see what she comes up with. Yeah, well, it's it. You know, I've been thinking about that because number one, I love Lisa and I love her drinks. Yes, and uh, you know, my from my experience and and from. From the history of the Addams Family, both the TV shows and the movies and everything, it's, you know, the Addams Family is about love and passion. Yes. In a dark, dark way. Yeah. So, so, um, whatever drink she comes up with, I hope she comes up with something that is very dramatic. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) It is drama. And, you know, it's, it's total drama. The thing that we were we've been talking about about this movie is that even though it's dark and macabre, it is they're so loving and they're such a functional family and you know there's it's just all love and and uh, a hashtag marriage goals because this couple is so <laughs> wonderful. Oh, completely. They, you know, the Adams family, you know, is was the anti ideal. I think when it came out. Um, especially in the cartoons, the films were based on the cartoons, not the TV show. Right. So, so the original drawings of Charles Adams is what the films were based on. Yeah. And if you and if you go through those, um, it's all about being anti, not love, not family, but anti normal. Yeah. Um, and and you know I've never read a, a biography of Charles Adams, but. I've always wondered if what his life was about and and how he had had come to embrace the idea of of um, diversity right because I, I think that really is what it, the, the bottom line was about letting people be who they were are even if you think it's dark and weird and strange but it certainly wasn't about um, hate. Yes. It was all about love. It was it, the whole family. Yes, it was a functional family because they allowed each other to be unusual. Yes. Yeah. So great. And then, and then you, um, you were in the second film as well. And I was. they invited me back, which I was like, so I remember being so like honored. Oh, um, yes. Um, because I was part of the family, and I will always consider myself to be a part of the family. I don't think there was even a Lumpy Adams of the cartoon, so I, I consider, I always imagine of what Lumpy Adams' life would have been like. <laughs> um. Yes. So what 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 was your backstory, and what do you think he's doing today? Oh, well, you know, okay, here it is. Oh, God. I, I've been wanting to, like, write something, but... I, I actually think that he grew up in the bell tower of some college or university. Oh, that's perfect. That, that no one knew he was there, but he just, he, he loved books, but he was very dark type scientist in a bell tower. Yes. And, um, and uh, being that I'm gay, I, I also imagine that he was in the sense that, like, I don't know. I think I imagined when I when I thought of this his old backstory, not back then. I this has taken years for me to kind of like think about. I, I think that his his husband would be like a vampire type oh. character, and um, 
and he would fly in through the window of the bell tower. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love so, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had this whole I had this whole story worked out about about who he was and who he's become. But then, in the future, I think Lumpy grew up to be some kind of professor at a at a university. I don't know why. I just think that he um, he he would. Lumpy was really smart but shy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I love it. Okay, you need to make a short film or something of this because this would be amazing to see Lumpy like 20 years later, you know, 30 know, years later. Well, you know, I have this whole I have this whole story worked out, which I'll tell you offline, but I don't want anyone to take it. And yeah. I also don't want to be sued by Paramount <laughs> or whoever owns the rights for like taking their character. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us, do you, what are your memories from on set? Now, in the movie, you interact with Christina Ricci and Angelica Houston. Did you interact yes. with them much? Um, yes. So I was still 17 um, at the time and a senior in high school. It was like my last, I got the job before Christmas, but we filmed it after Christmas. So it was my last semester of high school. Okay. And I was gone for a week and a half or something like that during the actual filming, but then gone various other days, like I said, when I had costume fittings. And there was even dance rehearsals because the the scene, the party scene I was in, in the original film, was going to be this huge production number, um, which they cut. I, they even cut what we filmed. You didn't oh, wow. see of what they filmed. But um, my part ended up being just just what you saw although we rehearsed a whole bunch of other things oh okay um so me and christina were like kind of together a lot for that um and how old was she at the time do you remember she was i think she was like 10 or 11 okay she she had just done the the film mermaids with Cher right and winona ryder and interest another a few interesting facts happened. A few interesting things happened while I was on set. First, Christina had her birthday. Oh. And yeah, and I can't remember how old she was again. But but the funny thing was, I had to go to school with them technically because I was still in school. Right. So me and Christina and Pugsley, the kid who played Pugsley, and I forget his name, but um. Uh, I had to, like, go with them and their studio teacher. And all the studio teacher really said, because he knew I was a uh, senior in high school, he's all, oh, read a book, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, while we were in school one day, Christina got a package. And it was a, uh, it was a gift, and she opened it, and she, and she goes, oh, this is from Cher. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes. I'm sitting there going... God, she's, she's getting a, a gift from Cher. So she opened it, and I think it was like earrings or something, very, very cute and pretty. It, it was some kind of jewelry, I yeah. believe. So that happened, and I was like, wow, this is surreal. And yeah. then when we were on the set also was one of the days was the nominations for the Academy Awards. And that year, Angelica was up, got nominated for the movie The Grifters. No way. Yeah. So so we were filming one day and um the day that she was nominated, they 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 kind of stopped filming, I think it was around lunch, and they rolled on this table with a huge um champagne tower of glasses and we all toasted to well I didn't because I was <laughs> <laughs> underage, so they didn't give me they gave me apple juice, I think. But um, but they everyone toasted on this huge soundstage. Everybody, I mean, like everyone, all the crew came and got a glass, and everyone was like, "Congratulations, Angelica!" It was a it was a wonderful um, environment. Um, oh. I have to say that that Scott Rudin, the, the producer, and um, oh my God, I'm forgetting his name now. Barry Sonnenfeld. Yes. Oh my God, I never never have forgotten that, but. Um, they were very, and I hope they still are this way today, but they were very nice men. 
um, and Raul and Angelica. Everybody was super nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It I was, mean, it was just a wonderful, weird experience for me all the way around. Yeah. I have goosebumps about um, that story, like the Academy Award nomination and, and the acknowledgement. And you were there for that moment. Like, that's, that is, that is so totally surreal. Ugh. Yeah. And then the other surreal moment was, I mean, Angelica in that costume. Now, I don't, I don't know what people think of Angelica now or, or whatever, but she's, very, she's always been very different looking, exotic. Yeah. Um, the funny thing was, when we went to a rehearsal one day, this was before the day of the filming, like, I walked into the rehearsal, it was this big rehearsal studio, and they had all the dancers there, they hired a ballroom dance troupe, in fact, but um, I was looking around, and I saw Christina, and um, I was, I asked someone, is, is Angelica here? Because, you know, I she was she's hollywood royalty and i knew who she was and i said it's angelica here and there was this person standing in front of me looking at the dancers but i so i saw their back and it was someone with like a cut off t-shirt really like fit arms tall and i actually thought and i can't remember what the hair was but i thought that's that's either a guy or, or somebody and um and they go she's right there and from the back, I didn't even look. I can't even remember seeing her from the front that day. And I think uh. she walked out. She walked out um, quick, shortly after that. And I was like, oh, okay, there she is. And, um, of course, she was in rehearsal wear, looking like a normal person. Yeah. But then, but then the, day, the, the, the day, the first day that we filmed, and she walked on the set. I'm not kidding. I thought the queen had walked in. Oh. She looked she looked um, ethereal, like an angel. Wow. Um, now, of course, in the film, you'll notice they put a, like a pin light on her eyes wherever she was standing. She never, she, I don't think in the entire film she ever moved um, because her eyes were always lit up. Right. With a, lo- with a little light that made her look um, even more beautiful but i i can't tell you that she i she didn't even need that because when she walked in in those dresses which if you if you look at them closely they're all different but um the dresses that she wore just made her look like some kind of queen i i can't even it was just a weird ethereal experience wow. and i remember i remember the day that we toasted her and she was standing by that table just thinking I'm I'm really here for this this is just really amazing oh, so that is incredible yeah. yeah it really was it I'm... was like being on the set to me of the when they filmed it must have been like when they filmed the Wizard of Oz like you didn't even see half of you didn't see the graveyard and all the amazing things they built for for the set it was wow. all amazing oh that is so incredible yeah I I am so thankful that um, we have this movie and these this cast and and everything is just perfection. I just I can't get over how much we loved this rewatch. Yeah, it really. It, I think it is a film that will stand the test of time, and and because there was such care given to it, I think from everybody right. at the time. So. That's awesome. Well, Ryan, yeah. I would read a book of your experiences on film and TV sets. I think it is fascinating. <laughs> and have you been in any Thank other you. have you been in any other horror movies so we know when we can um, interview you again because this is amazing. Well, I, I let's see horror movies. Yes. Well, two and a half. One is a no. There, I think they're all three kind of comedy B grade movies. And I, I don't even consider the Adams Family a horror movie. I consider right. it a family a family uh, holiday movie, actually. Yeah, I think so, too. Because uh, they always show it around Christmas or Thanksgiving. But there is a few. Um, the first one, really low-grade, B-grade movie, but Ron Howard's brother is the star, and it's called The Ice Cream Man. I have never seen oh. it. <laughs> I, I mean, I recognize it, and I, I can picture the cover art. Yes. 
Yes. So so it's called the Ice Cream Man, and I forget now who I played in it too. I was either a nerd or a pizza boy or someone like that because that's who I always was. Okay. Um, I think no, I think in that one I was a one hour photo. Remember those places? Yes. Um, <laughs> type type uh, worker. So I did that movie. I did another movie called Amanda and the Alien, which was um, one of the girls from Charles in Charge, who I think was also on Baywatch for a while. Um, Amanda something or other. Okay. And then, what was the last one? I did that. Oh, and then, it's not a horror movie, but I, it kind of is, but a movie about... Um, Nancy Kerrigan and Tommy Harding, but it was like a parody called the At- Attack of the Five Foot Two Women, and it was a Julie Brown film. Oh. That I think it was on HBO for a little bit. Oh, okay. But I was in that one, I was like one of the people she interviewed to club Nancy Kerrigan. <laughs> and then. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So. Oh, well, that uh, that is fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. And is there anything you want to plug or anything you want people to know? Um, no, I just, I just, I'm so excited that there's going to be a drink that Lisa is making. Um, I do want everyone to know that Lisa and I lived together for two years and she's one of my dearest friends. And that's yes. how I came to know you and, and. Um, I, I hope that we hang out sometime yes. at some point. But um, but yeah, let's make make something magical and wonderful and passionate and fun because that's what that's what the Adams family is about. It's, yes. it's really about just love and darkness and the love of darkness and life. Actually. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Ryan. You're welcome. So isn't that awesome? I'm, I had no idea. I'm sure you probably told me that before, but I just, I didn't even think, but he stuck in my mind because he was, he was only in it for like a minute in the first one, but he was memorable. So that's cool. Yeah. And he got to dance with Christina Ricci and he had that moment with Angelica Houston. So it's so awesome. Um, I, I can, I could gush about this movie forever. Like, what else do you want to say about it? I mean, I'm happy that these sort of movies existed um, and and exist still that are horror, but they are more accessible to kids, um, especially kids like mine who aren't, you know, they, they aren't ready to be exposed to, um, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street. I will get those right someday. Um, so I like that, you know, and and that kids can watch this and also, and not just kids, but I'm, I'm definitely looking at it from that perspective because it was important to me um, that they can look at it and be like, Oh, you know, just, just an identifier and just be like, wow. Okay. And also I think everybody should watch it and um, sort of appreciate the family dynamics. And I love how positive, you know, uh, Gomez is such a like crazy character in this, but he's so positive. And like that, those are always the type of people that I'm trying to be around are positive people, but also people who like dark things. And so this family, I wish, I wish I could be friends with them. Can you imagine if the Adams family really existed and like you go over to their house I would be over there all the time. <laughs> I love them so much. Everything, like you said, Gomez, he doesn't think ill of anybody. And when bad things really do happen to him and they have to move into the hotel, he doesn't know what to do with himself because he's never had anybody betray him before or felt like it. Yeah, he's just, I, I love how sort of indefatigably positive he is. And um, he's just, he's just, uh, yeah, I, I love that. And it, it's like, again, we were talking in People Under the Stairs about subverting your expectations. And, and that's what's so great about this family. And that's why I think um, so many people identified with them is, and, and what I've said about Lydia in the past is, you know, she's, she's complicated. She loves dark things, but she's a good person. And it's the same here where there's this family of people and they're not, you know, they're not the devil's rejects or something, you know, they're, they're really good people. And yet they and they all just support each other and um i don't know i just loved it i love it so this is um from a post on tumblr about the adams family and this line that they're referencing is actually from adams family values but 
It's all relevant. Fester is asking Gomez, how do you do it? How can I be like you? How can I be suave? Because he's trying to find a woman in his life. And Gomez says, woo her, admire her, make her feel like she's the most sublime creature on earth. And the Tumblr comments are that he gives better relationship advice than 90% of dudes. He loves his wife more than his own life, and everybody should be like him. Um, and that their relationship, Gomez and Morticia, have a very loving an extremely healthy relationship both in the old TV show and in the movies and they're also one of the first television couples to be shown to have an active albeit off-screen sex life like think about that they they don't shy away from it I mean we don't see it but like that's fine their frank attitude towards sexuality was shocking in its time but their relationship and their family dy dynamic is actually more functional and more sane than most families portrayed on TV even though like Obviously, they're very extreme. They, it's so functional. The comedy in, sh in the show came from the family's odd lifestyle rather than from infighting, petty bickering, or worse, as was common in other shows of the time. Think about this, thinly veiled references to spousal abuse. Think about the Honeymooners. Think about all of those shows that it was like, oh, why I oughta. It wasn't about that. They had a loving relationship. They didn't make fun of each other. They didn't act like their children were creatures from another world they were strange and outside of social norms but they were reunited in creating a loving home and being good supportive parents they support and adore their children cage care for an aging mother and an estranged brother put family before anything and love each other wholly fiercely without reserve they're every bit as much in love after at least a decade of marriage as they were the day they met it's relationship goals and life goals and even when their child in the third in the in the next movie which i'm spoiling is normal for a while they still open their hearts and love and accept him even when he's not like like them who was the tumblr person who wrote that i just want to it was me just kidding <laughs> okay so this is several um post it's better stay absurd be musedly bespeckled, obstinate Nocturna, and Breland Walker, who uh, wrote those wonderful words about the Adams family. Thank you for the I loved all that. And while you were talking, I was thinking about sh old shows that I watched that were airing in some similar times. And I was thinking about I Love Lucy, and you mentioned Honeymooners, and it was like, there certainly was no reference to their sex life, and I love Lucy. They lived, I mean, they had separate beds, but um, also this feeling that Lucy was always, like, having to explain herself to her husband and um, that there was, like, a, yeah, that there was sort of an antagonistic side to marriages, and, I mean, that's gone. Think of any sitcom, I mean, from the 90s to today. There's always this sort of antagonistic sort of relationship and, um, yeah, it's so nice and refreshing to have this. And not only that, but it's in this world, this goth sort of world. So, um, yeah, I'm, I would be proud to say that I'm an Adams Family fan because, because of all those reasons. So um, are you ready to rate? No? I want to talk about healthy marriages on TV for a second before we rate. I'm going to annoy you. I'm going to tell you two shows that you should watch that have healthy marriages portrayed. Complicated, healthy marriages. Friday Night Lights, Coach and Mrs. Coach. <laughs> I'll always say it. They have a strong marriage where they support each other. They don't always agree on everything, but it's a loving relationship portrayed on TV. And it's the same thing. Um, not making fun of her, trying to support, make, not making fun of each other, trying to support each other. The other healthy marriage, and it sounds bizarre but it's the americans which is in its final season right now if you haven't watched the americans you should because it's such a good spy show but it's about this family and this marriage and it's complicated and wonderful and like they're both spies and they like have to dress up and like be other people sometimes and that's kind of hot too <laughs> Well, you have to have the hot level for it to be a good functional marriage. But yes, okay. I will get around to watching those. <laughs> Kelly is looking at me like she doesn't believe me. <laughs> okay, let's let's rate it. What should we what's our on things? On thing on crawling um hands that have personalities but can't talk or see. 
My kids, my kids love the love thing, but they had a lot of questions <laughs> about that too. Um, I'm gonna give Adam's family eight um, hands because I love it. Um, it's great, uh, and I, I think eight's a pretty solid number. I'm giving it a nine. I th- I just think it speaks so much to me. I love this family and marriage dynamic, and we could all aspire to be the Adamses. Hi, horror friends. I'm so excited about this week's movie selection, as it is one I really love, and someone I adore is actually in this film. Hey, Ryan. For this week, I've made what I like to call Karamiya. The deep sensual affection Morticia and Gomez have for one another is iconic, and so I decided to utilize ingredients that are all aphrodisiacs. Yeah, we are going to sexy town, ladies and gentlemen. For this drink, you will need vodka, two cups fresh seedless watermelon, eight large basil leaves, pomegranate juice, vanilla extract, a blender, a strainer, a shaker, a cup, ice, and a martini glass. Let's get started. First, set aside a nice piece of watermelon and a single leaf of basil. Then grab your blender and toss in the watermelon, seven basil leaves, half ounce pomegranate juice, and just a light dash of vanilla extract. Blend until liquefied. Then grab your strainer and slowly pour out the contents of the blender through it into a cup. You will have to empty the strainer a few times to allow for just the liquid to come through, but it is worth it. Once you've strained it all out, ice up your shaker and add one and a half ounces of vodka, three ounces of our blended juice mix, and one ounce of pomegranate juice. Seal it up and give it a good shaking. Pour out into your martini glass and garnish with that piece of watermelon and basil leaf you set aside earlier. The basil gives the drink a very fresh feeling and the watermelon will make you so happy to remember summer is on its way. And what a better season to watch a sexy, funny horror flick. Cheers, horror friends. So since Meg picked the movie, it's my time for a fast forward pick. And I'm not talking about something horror this week, Meg. Uh Uh-oh. All you people better just tune out now. (laughs) So we make the rules. And sometimes we just talk about things that, you know, we've watched that aren't in the horror world. And I'm going to talk to you about Lost in Space. No spoilers, but Lost in Space. I feel like that's adjacent. I feel like sci-fi is adjacent. So that's pretty that's pretty good. I checked it out because I kept seeing people whose opinions I trust like on on social media being like, "Holy crap. This where did this come from? I didn't realize I was going to love this." And so I watched it with my two kids. My 11-year-old freaking loved it. My four-year-old caught episodes here and there, and she was busy doing other things. But we got through it so quickly because we could not stop watching it. We were shouting at the screen sometimes and reacting bigly. I know bigly is not a word. My son was making, like, charts and diagrams trying to figure things out because there's these elements of mystery and, and, and it's inspiring for science. There's a female scientist, her daughter, who's only 18, is a doctor because of the circumstances of the world. Her other daughter is like a mechanic, and she's like 16. They're amazing female characters. They've gender swapped some characters. Dr. Smith, if you've watched the old show, is now a female character. And it is so good and fascinating. And like this whole thing on Twitter is that the robot is hot. I don't know about that, but... This show is good. And there's some ships. There's some relationships. And there's kids. And it's so good. The boy is 11 in the show. And, like, Campbell's just like, that's me. Like, this is me. And this is and, and there's moral and ethical choices to be made about humanity and yourself and your family. Like, it's so good. I'm inspired from that speech. <laughs> that I... I I think I'll be watching that before Friday Night Lights and the Americans. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but, you know, I it's a quick watch. I think there's eight or ten episodes. I don't know. 
it's not like you have to get through six seasons of 24 episodes each. So yeah, that, that definitely like, like Friday Night Lights. Um, but I recommend it. If you have not watched Lost in Space or if you just remember the old show, you might want to check out the new one. Did you watch the old Lost in Space? No, I really don't have a lot of reference. Um, my dad, the other day, he babysat, and I think he watched it. I should ask the kids if they watched it with him, but um, the new one. And he was a fan of the original, and he was liking the new one. So I thought that was promising. Yeah, good. Well, check it out. That's my recommendation for the week. So until next time, we'll see you in the horror section. Bye.